pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for the name of Jesus. There's something so powerful about that name. And I know on a day like today, where we have a lot of visitors, some people are wondering what is so powerful about that name. God, in our time together, I pray that your name would give hope, that your name would lift burdens and open up eyes and soften hearts. Your name would do the impossible. You know our hearts. You know what we're searching for. Resurrection and life. And because you are alive, because the grave is empty, because death has no power over you, today we can be alive. So we give this time to you. Let us not miss the power of your resurrection this Easter. In Jesus' name, this is our prayer. And we say, amen and amen. He's alive. And because Jesus is alive, we can be alive. Why don't you turn to five people, tell them that. Say, we can be alive today. We can be alive. Maybe the person next to you looks a little dead. It's early. We can be alive today. You may have a seat. Uh, I'm just going to assume at an 8.30, we have a lot of visitors because this place is packed. And so let me introduce myself. I'm Eric Gamero. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I've been married for the past 11 years to my best friend, Jessica. I got... Three kids under six years old, which means life is not boring for me. I don't, I don't know if you had to, you know, herd your squirrels to get to church this morning. Like children, they get so distracted. Put on your shoes and, oh, well, look, it's Paw Patrol. And so uh, some of you, you know what I mean, that life is not boring. And uh, I do see some of your faces. And so I know you're trying to figure out what's going on. Eric Gamero, he doesn't look like his face. His eyes don't look like Gamero. And so let me just say, yes, I am Asian, sort of. My dad's Cuban. My mom's Korean. And I am a mess. (laughs) Um, I I have so many imperfections, so many faults, and so many failures. And so if you're anything like me, if you've got some imperfections, welcome. Welcome. Welcome to the perfect place for imperfect people. As we begin this Easter morning, I have a very theological, spiritual, deep question that I need to ask and I need a response from. And the question as we begin this morning is this. Am I the only one who loves the movie Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey? Anyone love the movie Bill and Ted's Bogus? Yes! Yes! Come on! We got like 12 people in. I'm not even exact. Don't judge me if you don't like it. It's one of my top five favorite movies of all time. And I realize a lot of you are like, Bill and Ted's, what is, what is that? Let me explain. Let me give you a brief synopsis of the movie. This is the follow-up to Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, which is a movie about Bill S. Preston Esquire and Ted Theodore Logan of the Wild Stallions and how they travel through time in a phone booth to save themselves from failing high school. And so in Bill and Ted's bogus journey, the follow-up to the excellent adventure, now they are traveling still in a phone booth, but, but through time and space to save the world. And, and on their journey, they die. And they find themselves in heaven, and they're before an angel. And the angel says, if you want to pass through the gates, you have to answer the question, what is the meaning of of life. And uh, I just want to say that's not how it works, okay? And so we'll talk about that in, in later weeks. Uh, that's not how heaven and eternity works, but, but I think how they responded to the question can help us find eternal life. And so how Bill S. Preston Esquire and Ted Theodore Logan answered the question, what is the meaning of life? They, they answered it with lyrics from uh, the 80s hair rock band Poison, And they began to say to this angel, every rose has its thorn. Just like every night has its dawn. Just like every cowboy sings a sad, sad song, every rose has its thorn. How can you not love that movie? It's so great. So good. 
you don't think so, but that's okay. <laughs> but I love the answer. Every rose, everything that's beautiful has its thorn, has its brokenness. Every season of life is full of light and dark. Why is that? Why, why does life get difficult sometimes? Why is there pain? Why do bad things happen to good people? If you've ever asked that question, I want to let you know, don't feel bad about that. You're not alone. Billions of people have asked that question all throughout history. In fact, you, you can't even open up this book called the Bible without seeing questions like that from Moses and Abraham and David and Jeremiah asking questions like, God, where are you? Why did you let this happen to me? Why, why are my enemies approaching me? Why am I overwhelmed from all sides? Why are there mosquitoes? So unfair. Why can't I eat bacon and curry goats? And this is why I watch movies like Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey. Movies that make me laugh because if you turn on the television, it's filled with all sorts of bad news, isn't it? And we ask that question, why is there so much death? Why is there so much suffering? Why are these natural disasters taking lives of people? And even if you don't watch the news, it, it's a deeply personal question. Maybe we ask or maybe we know someone who's asking the question, why can we not have children? Why? Why did she get diagnosed with breast cancer? Why did he get a brain tumor? Why, no matter how hard I try and all that I give and all that I push, I can't seem to get ahead, but, but he does. It's not fair. Today I want to talk about the devastation of life, the difficulty of life. I want to talk about thorns that we experience, but, but more than anything, I want to share hope today, how we can thrive from all of our thorns. Now, I, I want to make this very clear. I, I won't be able to answer every single question that you may have. I, I just, I, I don't have the time for that, first of all. And second thing is, I don't know all the answers to all the questions you may have, but what I want to do is I want to invite you back next week as well. Don't, if you're visiting here today, don't wait till Christmas or next Easter to come back. I want to invite you to come back next week as we, as we seek to, to answer some of these questions by looking at how God sees us. And spoiler for next week, when he looks at you, he sees love. He sees his child. So I invite you to come back next week, but today I, I want to answer this question. Why are there thorns in life? First answer that I want to submit to you today is maybe, maybe because we live in a broken world. Why are there thorns? Maybe because we live in a broken world. Now, if you've ever read Genesis 1, 2, and 3, by the way, side note, for those of you who have never read the Bible, don't start in Genesis. Please don't do it, because it'll go from Genesis, Exodus, and then by Leviticus, you'll get bored, and like, what is that? and you'll quit doing Start in John, then, then read the book of Acts. That's a better place to start. But if you've ever read Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, you see how God created everything perfect, everything beautiful, but then in Genesis chapter 3, this good world that God created became not as good, because Adam and Eve sinned. They ruined everything for all of us. Thanks, Adam. Thanks, Eve. Great job, except it's not just them. Romans 3.23 says, for everyone, say everyone, everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. What is sin? Sin is, is, is when we live life on our own, when we don't live according to God's perfect standard, when we don't live our life the way that God intended us to live it. It's our rebellion. It's our selfish ways. Sin actually robs us from the standard of life that God has created us for. But we sin, all of us. Can we admit that? Can we admit this also, that sin feels good? Can I admit that in church? Yes, you can. Perfect place for imperfect people. Sin feels good. Tell someone, sin feels good. 
I don't know that I can do that in church. If, if it didn't feel good, you wouldn't do it. I was racking my brain seriously for weeks because I've said this before and I didn't want to say it again, but I couldn't think of something better to, to illustrate the power of sin except Taco Bell. And so <laughs> sin is like Taco Bell. I had Taco Bell this past week, Tuesday, as we were preparing our, doing our final preparations for Easter. I'm with the pastors, and I ordered Taco Bell, and it was delicious. It smelled so good, a double-decker taco and a chili cheese chalupa. It's just so delicious. I'm not exaggerating. Five minutes after I was done, I deeply regretted it, right? Sin is like Taco Bell. It looks good. It smells good. It's so beautiful. Like, how can you not? It's so inexpensive. But sooner or later, you're going to pay for it. Do you know what I mean? You know what I mean. I don't need to explain it. Sin looks beautiful. Sin feels good, but sooner or later there is a price to pay. And if we go back to the beginning, what did sin break? What did sin bring? Genesis 3.17. And to the man, God said, since you listened to your wife and ate from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat. I gave you everything. I said, don't do this. And you, you did what I told you not to do. The ground is cursed because of you. All your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it, and it will grow thorns and thistles for you. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return from the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you will return. Because of sin, because of rebellion, because we don't live according to God's standard and the beautiful standard he has for us, there is now sin. There is now death. And creation is paying the price for sin. And I want to let you know, this, this is not the life that God has for us. This is not what God intended for us. And today, today there's hope. Today we can have new life. But why are there thorns in life? Second thing I want to submit to you is maybe, maybe because we brought it on ourselves. Now, some of you don't want to hear that. Maybe we brought it on ourselves. Galatians 6, 7 says, don't be misled. You cannot mock the God of justice. You will always harvest what you plant. It's not just a spiritual principle. It's practical. What you put into the ground, what you plant, is, is what you are going to reap, is a type of fruit that's going to come from that. And here's how Jesus put it in Matthew 13, 3. He told many stories in the forms of parables, such as this one. Here's Jesus' story. He says, listen, a farmer went out to plant some seeds, and as he scattered them across the field, some seeds fell on a footpath, and the birds came and ate them. And other seeds fell on shallow soil with underlying rock, and the seeds sprouted quickly because the soil was shallow, but the plant soon wilted under the the hot sun, and since they didn't have deep roots, they died. Verse 7 says, other seeds fell among what? Thorns. That grew up and choked the tender plants. And in verse 9, he says, anyone with ears to listen should listen and understand. Now, if you don't understand, uh, again, have no fear. Jesus Followers didn't understand, and so he began to explain to them with very specific words. In verse 22, Jesus said, The seed that fell among the thorns represents those who hear God's word. But all too quickly, the message is crowded out by the worries of this life and the lure of wealth. And so no fruit is produced. How come... I am not growing, but they are. How come I, I am not seeing change in my life, but if I look at them and there's change, that's not fair, God. And, and so Jesus is explaining to his, his friends and his followers, this is the explanation of why there's no growth and there's no fruit in your life. If you're wondering, how come there's no growth and maturity in my life, let me tell you, the problem isn't the seeds. There's no problem with God's seeds. There's nothing wrong with what God has deposited and planted in you. God knows the power of the seed. God knows the plants that his seeds can produce, and they are good. The problem, the problem might be that our soil is full of thorns. He says the worries of this life. The worries of this life, not the responsibilities of this life. 
It's not your children. It's not your family. It's not your spouse. It's not the gifts that God has given you that are causing you to worry. It's the worries of this life. It's, it's what we don't have. It's, we're, we're thinking about what happened last week. We're thinking about what may happen next week. We're thinking about what we don't have right now that's causing us not to be satisfied with what we do have right now. 830, can, can we just give God thanks for, for what he's given us already? We live in South Florida. The weather's great today. You got here in a car or a bus. We got AC, praise God. We have AC. There's some great breakfast. Bananas foster. Bananas foster. He's a mad scientist, the, the, the people in the cafe. A bananas foster croissant French toast. Like, what? Thank you, God, for what we have. It's the worries of this life, though. What we don't have and what may or may not happen. He says also the lure of wealth. Now, is money bad? Is money bad? No, money's not bad. God never says that money is the root of all evil. A lot of us think that. God says the love of money is the root of all evil. So money is good. Turn to your neighbor, tell him money is good. Money is good. See, every good and perfect gift comes from God. And so if we have it, it's because God gave it to us. So we need to have a perspective change on what we have. And so it's not having money that's the problem. It's when we love money. And our love for money has us that becomes the problem. It's when we seek after money selfishly. And now we are not satisfied with what God has already given us. And so now we need to find more stuff to lead to satisfaction. Because if I just have more stuff, then I'll finally be satisfied with life. And it's those things that choke and suffocate what God wants to do in our lives. If I just had more, then I'd be satisfied. And, and then we begin to find our self-worth and our net worth and define our lives by what we have. And when we do that, it suffocates the good fruit that God wants to produce. And so if we could change our perspective about the problems we're experiencing and change our perspective of the property that we have and the provision that God gives to us, can I tell you with complete confidence that, that he will change our lives even though our situation doesn't change at all? If we can see from a new perspective of God's provision, he can do incredible things even in the midst of all our thorns. Today, God wants to give you a new perspective. He wants to give you new life. But why are there thorns? Why are there thorns in life? Why is it not fair? Why do bad things happen to good people? Maybe, maybe because God wants to do something big. Maybe God wants to do something big. Paul, who, who wrote a majority of the New Testament, who probably taught us more about Jesus than anyone else second to Jesus, he said this. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he says, I was given a what? I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me and to keep me from becoming proud. Paul had a thorn. And some theologians think it was a disability or a chronic pain. Some theologians think it was a person. I mean, he even called it a messenger from Satan. And, and some of us in here, we know, we know what that means. Maybe you have a thorn in your flesh, someone who is a pain in your side, a person. And if they're here with you, point to them right now. Let them know. You're a me no, don't do that. Messengers of Satan right here, right next to me. They fought. No. We don't know what the thorn was in his flesh. And when we don't have to know, and I'm glad we don't know, because if we did know what it was, we'd say, well, that doesn't pertain to me. When the reality is all of us, we have our own private thorns in our life that lead to so much pain. Paul says, I have a thorn. But he gave us the purpose of the thorn. He said it was to keep me from becoming proud. Proud. Proud of, of what? Proud of what God is doing through you. You need to know today that God didn't create you just to exist. 
He, 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 didn't, he didn't create you just to, to be a seed that just stays settled. He, he created you to blossom. He created you to thrive. He created you to grow. He created you so that he can do something wonderful in you and through your life. He created you with purpose and intention, and he's given you so many problems, but maybe uh, promises, but may, maybe you're like me. And, and maybe when God is using you, I'll just admit it, I tend to get a little bit puffed up sometimes and, and prideful. And because God loves me, because God loves us, sometimes he allows thorns to be in our life to keep us from becoming proud of what he is doing. Why are there thorns in life? Maybe because God wants to do something big. And he wants to keep us proud. He wants to keep us humble. Verse 8, three times Paul says, I beg the Lord to take it away. See, Paul isn't a masochist. No one likes pain. And God isn't cruel. He's not out to punish us. But God was more concerned in Paul's development and character and preventing pride than he was about taking away the pain. There's hope because of the resurrection. But, but I, I need you to understand that the good news of Jesus isn't that he takes away our pain. The good news of Jesus is that he gives us power to get through. God didn't take away Paul's problems, but God gave him overwhelming grace and power to get through all of his problems, to walk through his problems with grace. Verse 9, he says, each time Jesus said, he said, my grace is all you need. You think you need the stuff. You think you need the titles. You think you need the vitamins and the gym time and, and the person beside you and the perfect life. My grace is all you need. And he says, my power works best. You want to see the power of God working at its best? works best in weakness. And so Paul says, so now I'm glad to boast about my weaknesses so that the power of Christ can work through me. And that's why I take pleasure in my weaknesses and in the insults and hardships and persecutions and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. For when I don't have, I have the presence of God with me. For when I'm at my lowest place, I have the power of God to help me get through it. Now, I'm not trying to minimize the pain that you're going through. I understand that there's some of us here with thorns that, that you don't understand why they're there. and You wouldn't wish them upon yourselves. And so I'm not trying to minimize the pain. But, but, but what I do know for sure is this. In all the difficulty that you'll go through in life, God has already done something to transform your life. He's using everything. He works everything, the good and the bad, for our good. He uses it all. I, w I would have never chosen that my parents got divorced when I was growing up. I would have never chosen that my stepmom, who raised me and loved me, died of cancer. I would have never chosen to be mistreated by people that I love and pastors that I served under. I would have never chosen that... My wife miscarried our first child. I would have never chosen that my wife be diagnosed with a tumor. But I'm better because of all of it. I'm stronger. I'm closer to God. And I know I'm not the only one. I know there's so many people right here in this room who would say that in my lowest part of life, the lowest and the darkest season of my life, that's when I felt closest to God. He works all of it together. We're all sinners. We're all imperfect people. And until we can understand that we are sinners in need of a Savior, all of our thorns will never seem to make sense. Why do good things happen to bad people? Something... Something bad only happened to someone good once in life, once in history. And his name was Jesus. And he willingly 
placed it upon himself. He took all of our thorns and he wore them as a crown. He became sin for us. He paid the penalty of the punishment that we deserved. And on, on that good Friday, hanging on a cross, he looked up to his father and his father turned away from him. He said, why? My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It's because of our sin. Because of our shame. Because of our brokenness. He put all of that upon himself. And then said, it is finished. Everything that needed to be done, I have finished it on the cross. And then they took his dead body and they buried it in the tomb. And three days later, as they got to the tomb, they saw the stone was rolled away. And Jesus was not there. Jesus was not dead. Jesus is alive. And because Jesus is alive, we can be alive. And because the tomb wasn't empty, it was cleared out, we don't have to ask that question, why do bad things happen to good people? Because the good news of the gospel is that good things happen to bad people. Good things happen to bad people like you and me. Listen, God is not fair. I get it. God is not fair. I agree with you 100%. Because if God was fair, then he would have given us the punishment we deserve. But instead, he gave us grace. He gave us love. He gave us Jesus. And that's the message of Easter. That's why we celebrate because Jesus died and rose, I can thrive from all my thorns. They're not going to keep me down. They're not going to stop me from growing. They're not going to choke out what God wants to do. Because Jesus defeated the power of sin and death. I can thrive from all my thorns. I love Molly and I love her story. She's part of our familia. She serves here now. She's such a joy to be around. She gives us so much hope and life and, and so much energy. And, and, and if you didn't see this video, you wouldn't think any of that are about her because she's just so life-giving. It's the life of Jesus that has caused her to thrive even in the midst of her thorns. And I know there's some of us here today. You're hurting. You're in pain. You're going through difficulty. And you feel the the presence of God saying, I want to give you rest. That's you. If you have some thorns that you don't understand, some pain that you're going through, and you say, I, I, I just need prayer right now. In a show of faith, would you stand to your feet? We want to pray for you. And as you're standing, stay there. We're going to pray. We're going to pray as a family, but God does far more than simply pray for us. He gives us his presence. And there's some of you here today, God wants to do far more than just pray about your problems. Maybe you're already standing or, or maybe right now you, you're sensing that I need forgiveness. I need God's grace. I need to know him like Molly knows him. I need the hope that she has. I need the hope that these people have, that they would stand to their feet and say, God can heal. God can give hope. I need Jesus. That's you. If you're sitting next to someone, you're not alone. You can squeeze your hand and say, it's me, it's me. That's you. And in a show of faith, would you stand to your feet as well so we can pray for you? church, the presence of God is in this place with power so we can get through every problem of life and the greatest problem that we'll ever face, the problem of sin and death has been defeated. So in a show of faith, would you reach out your arms to those who are standing and let's pray for them today. Let's pray that the presence of God will surround them and overwhelm them. Lord, thank you. Thank you that you are alive, Jesus. 
And thank you because you died and rose again that we can thrive from every thorn, Lord. So we pray for healing. We pray for, for provision, God. We pray that eyes would be open, Lord, that, that you would help them to hold on, that they would not give up, that they would not only see darkness, that they would not worry about what they don't have, but, God, they would celebrate that you are with us even right now and that you walk with us through the valleys of the shadow of death. And, God, you would give them hope to hold on to you. And, Lord, I pray for those who surrender to you, those who said, I need you, Jesus that your Holy Spirit, as you promised, would come fill their lives, that you'd make them whole, that you'd wash them, that you would fill them with hope and your life forever, God. And your promise to us is that, that you will never take that away, that there's nothing we can do to ever walk away from you because you're with us every step of the way and you are preparing a place for us in eternity. And so we surrender and we thank you for salvation. We thank you for resurrection and life and the hope and the promise and your good news 